panel is about disruption. And, and this word is becoming very dangerous because we are talking about disruption, then the disruption of the disruption. And, and let's try to just to understand a little bit better, better that. And manage strategy and manage this strategic intent under this environment is a topic that we want to cover now. So when, when we saw a, a Professor Minsberg a graphic with all the, uh, what is happening today is that there is arrow coming absolutely from everywhere at all moments. So when you try to reach out to one arrow, the arrow is not an arrow anymore. It's something else. So how do we handle this permanent uh, 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 crisis and this permanent disruption? And in order uh, to moderate this panel, I want to invite Julia Kirby, author and senior editor of Harvard University Press. And joining Julia on the stage, and on the stage, I want to invite Martin Reeves, director of the Boston Consulting Group Henderson Institute. And Martin is currently leading research on corporate longevity among several other initiatives. I want also to invite back to the stage Professor Henry and Alex Osterwald, please. I have this great opportunity to be a moderator that has to do very little in the way of introducing my panelists, since obviously you've already uh, heard from two of them. I'll just say just a couple of very quick things, which is that I get to hit highlights. And for me, highlights are always books. So I want to absolutely <coughs> mention uh, Henry's uh, forthcoming book. When, uh, it has the best title, Bedtime Stories for Managers. Mm -hmm. When's it due out? Is it, is it out yet? I don't know. It's going to be out in February. It's a collection of about 40 of my blogs about managing, <laughs> about organizing, about analyzing. Here's the mic. Oh, uh, Paul. Which one is it? OK. Or I can just quickly summarize. It's a, it, uh, if you're not already following Henry's blog, which is technically called a twog, um, then please uh, look it up, because uh, the bedtime stories for managers, it's not because they, they will put you to sleep. It's because they're nice and short. And uh, that's because it's a, it's a compilation of his uh, best or favorite uh, blogs. So um, Henry, you've already heard from. Martin Reeves is next to him. Now, Martin is, is going to do a 15-minute uh, section next. So um, I do want to say a few things about him. And I'll start again with the book. Uh, his, uh, his book is Your Strategy Needs a Strategy. So that's kind of a meta concept. Like, you thought it was hard enough to come up with a strategy. Now you've kind of got to come up with a strategy for how you'll come up with your strategy. So I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Martin is a senior partner at BCG, managing director of its New York office, and the global director of the BCG Henderson Institute, which is BCG's think tank uh, that looks into issues like resilience, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and how it will affect workplaces, and uh, competing on the rate of learning, amongst other big ideas. Um, and then, of course, we have Alex Osterwalder, whom you know already. Again, I'll hit on the book that you, if you haven't already read his various <coughs> writings on the business model canvas that he developed. First of all, you could simply Google that phrase, and you will find voluminous amounts about it. But you really ought to take a look at business model generation yes. and value proposition design. Those are his two books uh, with Wiley, bestsellers. Uh, introduced a lot of people to the idea of how to redesign your business model. So we've, of course, this whole uh, day has been spent talking about turning strategy into reality and the gap that often exists between ideas and execution. Um, and that, and of course, we're going to continue to talk about that here. But the special emphasis of this panel is on how does any of that change if you're in a time of crisis? Um, so especially, now we could, as Ricardo was saying earlier, uh, just assume that we're in a state of perpetual crisis, but I think we'd all assume that, some, you know, that there are crises, and there are crises. You know, and, 
So sometimes uh, there is a really particular need to, uh, uh, to strategize in an extraordinary circumstance. And what I want to know from our panelists is, uh, is, is how is that different? Should it be different? Uh, and can we learn something from moments like that that would inform strategy, uh, design, and delivery uh, more generally? So one thing that Roger Martin said earlier that I loved was the distinction he made of two types of CEOs. Does anybody remember it? The two types of CEOs were the set piece CEOs and the read and react CEOs. And it was the people who had per, kind of a prepared script versus the people who could sense and respond what was going on. And I realized what we have in our panel is we have, we're doing both. So I have uh, set piece gurus here who are also uh, read and react gurus. We're gonna start with the set pieces. Each one of them is going to offer, uh, put out a point of view about why a uh, time of crisis creates different uh, or, or possibly not different um, challenges for strategists. So Henry, you kind of queued up that you were going to introduce us to some new things on this panel. Why don't you start? Okay, I think you want us to do like four or five minutes or something? Yeah, just put out some ideas. Yeah, so, so I, I think the idea of strategic learning is far more relevant in times of difficulty, crisis, unpredictability, because you, how can you plan, how can you think ahead, how can you even d deal with form strategies? You have to learn them as you go along. Whereas if you look at IKEA today, it's pretty stable for IKEA, from what I can tell, in the furniture business. So they learned it years ago, and they're just doing it. They're executing it now and, and doing it very well. I, I love this quote from a South African newspaper. A long-range weather forecast should be obtained before leaving, as weather conditions are extremely unpredictable. Um, and, and maybe that sort of covers it. You know, they discovered a, a manuscript written by a sailor who was in the Battle of Trafalgar after he died. And he had written down, he remembered everything in vivid detail, and he wrote it all down. And the boats weren't where they were supposed to be according to the plan and the, and the history. Um, and, uh, and I concluded from that that the farther back the battle is in history, the more deliberate the military strategy. Um, because they lose the emergent part of it, they lose the rest of it, and all they remember is how brilliantly it was executed. And of course, who's writing the history? Usually it's the, um, if he survived or whoever survived. So, so I just talked about thinking first compared with doing first, and, and there's also seeing first, which is the visionary. Um, a visionary like Steve Jobs, a visionary like... Uh, like um, uh, uh, you know, Watson in the computer business and so on. Well, Watson in 1948 said, I think there's a world market for about five computers. And Winston Churchill in 1939 said, atomic energy may be as good as our present day explosives, but it's unlikely to produce anything more dangerous. So even the visionaries didn't see it at first. They just saw it before other people, and that's the learning. They didn't see it. They didn't know it. They didn't, didn't come as a an apparition from the sky, uh, they learned it. And, um, and, and that's the way strategies uh, develop in times of difficulty and crisis. Um, maybe that's all I want to say. Um, in time, yeah, basically that's my introduction. OK. Martin, do you want um, <clears throat> to? I missed part of the morning, unfortunately, but I uh, listening so far to, to what has been said about the speeches, I think there's a, a sort of a cartoon that we're painting, which is that the, the strategy was, you know, very predictable and was planning based, and now the world's entirely different. We need a something to some new thing to replace that that old thing. And um, interestingly, I think um, business books in this discipline, of business strategy, which after all is fairly young, 1965, one of the first works. I mean, always begin by saying the world is more dynamic, more complex, and, and we need a new theory. Um, I've spent some time poring over the data as to whether that's actually the case. So what is certainly the case is the world is more dynamic. So the life cycles of companies and products seem to move faster on average. Uh, whether it is more uncertain actually depends upon which period you're talking about and which metric you're talking about. But take for granted that actually the world is more uncertain and is more fast moving. That's on average. I think the strategy should not deal with averages. Strategy should deal with the particular. So if there's been a shift in the environment that I would wish <coughs> to draw attention to, it's the fact that in 
whatever variable you choose to look at, whether it's the, the variance um, in, um, of, uh, of, of, of market prices or the mean period of leadership of companies, more or less whatever strategic variable you pick, the variance has increased, uh, which means that the gap between the fast growing companies, the slow growing companies, the uh, volatile industries, the less volatile industries has increased, which I think means inconveniently for strategists that, um, uh, that it, it becomes harder to generalize about strategy, that probably there's no single thing that we can say about strategy. So I, I, and I'm not sure this is where you were going, Henry, but I, I think you need to look at the particular circumstance. And um, I think there's, there are circumstances uh, take the chocolate industry for anything. I don't, I don't think w digital chocolate has been invented yet. Um, <laughs> chocolate tends to grow with uh, GDP. It's a, it's a fairly planable industry. And um, uh, so planning is still of some use. Um, there are probably more unpredictable industries where uh, more adaptive approaches are, are useful. Um, there are approaches where a visionary sees and does something for the first time. You know, visionary approaches is, is appropriate. Uh, there, are, there are now, it's possible with digital marketplaces and so on to have uh, collaborative emergent strategies where uh, more of a, uh, a collaborative approach is possible. So I think my opening message would be that the, um, the strategy for your strategy, the, the mindset for your strategy or the paradigm of your strategy needs to adjust to the particular circumstances of, of each business uh, that you're dealing with. And we should be, I think, uh, wary of, of, of generalizations. Okay, thank you. Alex. Um, if I could have the iPad, I'm, I'm going to build on a little bit on what we've seen this morning, but then get into the question of crisis. So if they can put up the iPad. Um, but I think one of the things that I see in the organizations I deal with around the world is there's a very similar reaction to crisis. And the reaction is always, we're going to focus on the core what we already do well because we need to fix things, we need to you know, uh, reduce the headcount in corporate, and that's not a bad thing. The problem is that while these organizations are focusing on the core, and often under the very intense pressure of activist hedge funds um, or activist investors, they actually kill the whole exploration part. Not intentionally, but they want to be so good at managing the core that they kill their future. And you just can't cost cut yourself to the future. It's not possible. Now, is it wrong to focus on this? No. I mean, take a lot of stories of turnaround. I mean, obviously, Apple is a good one where Steve Jobs came back and really focused. And that is a must. But at the same time, at Apple, they were building the future. And the organizations that I see from the inside or those that I read about in the press, they start this process, but I feel like they're killing this part. And a lot of the people, th those that you know, have the talent to innovate, they leave those companies if they're not fired. And they're losing their best innovation talent. And I do think, you know, building on the whole aspect of learning, strategic learning that we were talking about, well, strategic learning to create new growth engines is a bit different than the strategic um, you know, learning to, to, to uh, improve the core. So I think we need to remember that it's both, and it will be both even in times of crisis. So focus, yes, but don't kill the whole innovation engine while you're refocusing. Now, another example might be GE, where I think there was, you know, um, Richard, I think, mentioned GE this morning where there was an article in Harvard Business Review where he was talking about what they were building here in the exploration engine. And they were following this whole lean startup movement. And I think they were doing some really good work there. But in their case, they were actually not probably, and it's easy to say from a chair here, <laughs> um, they were not fixing the core enough. So it's not either or, it's an and, clearly. And that's what makes it so difficult because these two worlds are pretty different. <laughs> One is faster, one is slower, and then there's also similarities talking about the learning. So I think in times of crisis, you cannot just focus on one. You can't cost you, cut yourself to the future. You know, um, I'm going to ask all three of you this question. Just the, a big theme throughout the day, and we heard it first from Roger this morning, you know, was the level of engagement that is required in uh, strategy and in this, in, in, and that there shouldn't be this distinction between design 
and delivery. The same people should be involved in, in, in both. And he used the phrase, you need people at the bottom who think they are making choices. Um, my impression is in a crisis situation, all that goes out the window. And as much as people may, as, as, as true as that is, that the immediate um, effect of a crisis, and I don't know if this is human nature, where this comes from, but it seems like all eyes snap to the, if not leader, let's say, highest person highest paid person, what is it, the hippo, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, the highest uh, compensated paid person, person in the room. In yeah. the room. Mm -hmm. And um, elephant. Yeah, it's, and so, and there seems to be that sense of, uh, a shared sense of, okay, what matters in a crisis <clears throat> moment, things have changed on us suddenly, uh, some kind of response is required suddenly, and so what we need is decisiveness and speed, and so let, you know, let's not, deal with this inefficient process of lots of consensus or lots of participation, but let's just look for marching orders. It, am I right about that, first of all? Is that a bad thing? Uh, what, how could we, how could we, should we have a different response than that in a crisis situation? Martin, go ahead. Um, so I think we should probably distinguish between two, two types of crisis. I mean, there are, you know, things that happen to you that you're not prepared for. And um, you know, I think the evidence says that in those situations, um, if, if financial or competitive performance is declining, that, that speed is a key part of the uh, solution. And, um, and that may require more emphasis on, on, on top down. Um, but, but our analysis would suggest that the overwhelmingly most um, important success factor for, for transformations is actually the degree of preemption. So companies that initiate major change that impose a crisis on themselves while their competitive and financial performance is still above uh, industry median levels um, uh, actually are much more uh, likely to do, uh, to do well in the long term. And that sort of change is, is less, I think, reactive and, um, uh, and, and, and more creative and requires more exploration and therefore uh, is actually better done um, uh, bottom up uh, exploring uh, opportunities. And that's tied, I think, to um, a second observation, which is, in the short run, there are many ways of driving performance. You can financially re-engineer, you can, you can cut costs, um, <clears throat> you can improve margins. In the long run, um, for, the, for the top quartile of the S&P 500, I'm talking about a 10-year period, um, almost all of the increase in total shelter return of the high performers comes from growth, actually. And growth is a non-mechanical thing. Cost cutting can be somewhat, somewhat mechanical, but a growth, um, especially in times of um, aggregate declining growth, is about uh, is is about innovation, and so therefore needs those more sort of bottom up approaches. Henry, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I'll say something very different. Um, you know, there's there's uh, there's geriatric management, there's pediatric management, and there's obstetric management. So the obstetric management is, are the entrepreneurial startups. And I have full faith in them to turn on a dime because they often do. IKEA was developing under its entrepreneur and bang, suddenly came up with this idea about un unassembled furniture and they switched. It wasn't, wasn't tough. Um, a, a lot of management is geriatric. They're, they're in very stable, very established, very big organizations. And they're not the entrepreneurs and they may not even have that kind of exploration kind of talent. Um, so, so to depend on people like that to turn around an organization in crisis, it happens sometimes, uh, but more often it doesn't succeed. And in those cases, sometimes it's the bottom up that can generate the ideas if people are listening, and big if, if the company is established as a community of human beings and not a collection of human resources. There's got to be a sense of community ship so that ideas move around and people say, yeah, that's great, we need that, we'll do it. You put such an emphasis on strategy as a learning process. What about um, the connection of learning to times of crisis? Like, I, I feel that probably a lot of companies don't uh, capitalize on the learning event that a crisis could be. Yeah, because they're not established for, uh, uh, as learning organizations, whereas maybe from this little evidence, maybe Nikea was. You know, if a worker could come up with an idea 
and, 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 and that gets adopted by the whole organization, that sounds like a very, to use a popular word, a very agile kind of organization. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, to, to build on what Henry said, and come back to the point of leadership also, I think the, it's not an either or, again. <laughs> you need very strong leadership in general during crisis even more, but the leadership is about creating that um, context where ideas can emerge. And again, ideas are not the problem. They're everywhere. People are not the problem. It's the structures. So I believe that, that strategy is more and more about designing the right structures for learning actually to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think this is new, but I think it's, it is becoming a lot more important because we are in a dynamic world and business models expire faster than ever before. So if we don't create that context where the ideas can come from bottom up, and growth engines will always come from bottom up. They're rarely, don't want to be absolute, but they rarely are top down. Top down actually are usually large bets that blow up into 100 million or billion dollar failures. There's many of those. If you take IKEA, that was bottom up. Amazon Web Services was bottom up. And there was a strategic moment, of course, where the organization said, we're going into that. But these were bottom up. Yeah. And I showed the numbers before. They're, they're pretty big. Can I Henry? add one word? Please. Uh, I, I, I just would change one word. We need to get rid of top yeah. and bottom. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about grounded. Yeah. Not grounded and grounded. Yeah. Because if the chief executive isn't grounded, nobody else will be grounded. Yeah. Yeah. So really, we should, talk, we should all be talking about grounded yeah. and drop that top yeah. Yeah. middle vocabulary. And I will add another <coughs> vocabulary change is that we might want to start talking about the chief entrepreneur. Because if you take the, yeah. you know, one of the fastest growing companies, Amazon, it turns out the you know, chief executive is an entrepreneur and is behaving like a chief entrepreneur. And Apple is where they are today because there was an entrepreneur. So I think the, yeah. the question is, can organizations be managed today and continue to grow with anything else than an entrepreneur? I think the hard part of that, if, if I may uh, add a comment, is um, so assuming that we, we accept um, you know, Henry's contention that uh, we need to focus more on, uh, on, on bottom-up or grounded learning, um, I think it's easy to say that. I think it's a hard thing to do because it requires a special way of directing one's perception, one's, one's attention. It has to be very fine-grained. You know, how do you learn faster? How do, you, how do your visionaries see the, see the opportunities earlier? I mean, you, you have to pay attention to anomalies, the, the one data point that doesn't fit, or dissatisfactions, the 1% of customers that, that don't like your product. Um, or you have to pay attention to analogies, what's happening in a in another industry that may happen in, in your industry, which I think is, uh, is about um, <clears throat> a way of seeing things and therefore a very deep cultural trait. And I think that's, that's rather subtle. So I'm not sure the structure can solve for that. And I'm not, I'm not sure that maybe saying it can, is, is enough for people to actually do it. Hmm. Yeah. You know, top of, if I, can I just intervene quick? Top is, an, is a metaphor. It's purely a metaphor. It's, there's no reality other than the floor the person sits on and, and the salary, but otherwise, it's a pure metaphor, just like human resources or a pure metaphor. I'm not a human resource or a human asset. I'm a human being. And uh, I like chief explorer maybe more than chief entrepreneur. Love that. Love that. Adopted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, though, Henry, um, it's not, I mean, money is real. So when you say, well, it's just a metaphor, well, except other than salary. But I mean, in fact, the, the organization has placed a value on certain people as being more valuable than others. Maybe it's just a, a, a function of experience, but what, in your world, what is the work of the highest paid people in the organization? Oh, oh but I think, I think uh, uh, um, uh, Alex had it perfectly a few minutes ago, that to create the structure, to encourage a kind of community ship, to, to do all those things that will bring the ideas through the organization, not necessarily up, but through. I mean, you know, an organization is what you physically see. If it's in a building, then it's probably got trouble because people don't like to climb stairs. But if it's in a big flat area, look at that big apple round thing, um, then it's a horizontal thing physically. Um, but um, but uh, just, uh, I, I think, yeah, I mean, chief, it's my first, my doctoral thesis in my first book. I mean, what do chief executives do? Uh, they do all kinds of things. They give gold watches to retiring employees. They do all kinds. They, they keep the communication flowing and all that. Um, but for me, central to this discussion is the encouragement of, of exploration when necessary and exploitation yeah. when necessary, too. 
And t t tying that to the salary piece, I think there's one thing that we're observing that's very difficult for companies to deal with. So let's say somebody is working on the next growth engine, and um, that actually can emerge because you have 10 other teams who were also trying, but they didn't win. So you could, you could call them failures, but I've shown you the numbers. You can't pick the winner. So you actually need a lot of teams to experiment for one team to win. Now, if you call that one team the winner, you're really calling others failures, but they're not. They're contributing to the system. It turns out that in the pharma industry, you actually already have that. You know, scientists work sometimes their entire careers on molecules that never commercialize. It means that they could be seen as failures. But they know in R&D that we need those scientists to have some compounds that emerge. So we need to actually find a better way to reward those who are contributing to the system. So it's very, very difficult because you're going to have to start rewarding failure. And once you start doing that, you will actually avoid future crisis because you'll always have perpetually ideas coming up. So I think today we have organizations in crisis because they're not built for, for today's world. So I think crisis is, you can't avoid it. It's not inevitable. I do believe sincerely that we can build invincible companies. Right, good. I, I want to leave time for questions, so I want you to be thinking about your questions. So I'm going to throw out one more before we go to the floor, which is not a lot of talk has happened today about M&A. Um, now, the one um, intriguing for me exception was uh, uh, Vishal, and one of his slides had a, uh, a point that said, use M&A as an acceleration tool. That, you know, that's an interesting, intriguing. But when you think about, um, I mean, this is one of the major disconnects between design and delivery um, is when top management says, I, you know, we have a new strategy, but God forbid we entrust these people with executing it, present company, they have no idea how to do this, we'll just acquire it. And, uh, and we'll make our strategic statement through M&A and we will execute our strategy through uh, a purchase. Martin, what talk to so, so I've looked at something I call post-merger rejuvenation. Most mergers are um, to build scale and, and to uh, generate cost synergies, and that's a, that's a very good thing. Um, but um, I think the, the example of Disney and Pixar is a good one, where a large company acquires a small company with uh, interesting ways of doing things and chooses deliberately not to integrate it uh, for cost synergies, but actually um, cultivates the difference and uses it to cross-pollinate and stimulate the, the, the mothership. And, and so actually I've looked at post-merger reju rejuvenation. Um, it looks like the motives of companies merging are rarely for most post-merger rejuvenation. And even when they are, they rarely succeed. But some companies like Disney do succeed. And one of the key um, <coughs> success factors seems to be uh, not integrating, but rather um, treasuring the difference and more investing in in cross-pollination and stimulation. I, th I think it's, it's definitely a possible route to go because the, uh, the rebalancing of exploration and exploitation that um, Alex is talking about, um, it's, it's, it's a crisis uh, which, which many large established companies face. And we haven't seen the proof of the pudding yet. You know, we hope that's going to work. Um, but but, but M&A could be one of the routes to, to provide that stimulus, I think. Great. Uh, can, I, can I just yeah, add please. something to that? Because I think when we say M&A, we probably often think about the big acquisitions, Facebook with uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. And I think that is definitely a way to acquire growth and acquire rejuvenation. But what we don't think of is, well, what if you're learning at a ground level, you know, as an innovation team, you figure out what you should be doing, but then decide, okay, rather than doing it yourself, because now we're going in software business or AI, then you make the acquisition to go faster. So it's not acquiring a company, but it's acquire, well, acquiring a company, but not as a big entity already, but just to go faster. So it's not just the very big acquisitions. It can be smaller acquisitions that fit into your growth engine and what you're building. So I think we need to always remember that there's a whole scale there. And again, it's not, for me, it's never either or. It's the whole innovation spectrum, mergers and acquisition, doing it yourself, merging teams, everything. We need to really kind of get, a, I think, a little bit more sophisticated also with the language we use mm. <laughs> when we talk about these things. Um, it's it's a, whole, a, a whole series of things that we can do. And acquisition itself is a learning process in the sense that when you watch 
companies that are engaging in a lot of acquisitions, um, they don't always, if you go back to the tobacco industries, I think they started by buying the paper that they used, buying companies that made their paper. They, it was kind of a vertical integration form of acquisition. And gradually they learned their way in, in those days, they learned their way into food, uh, but it took time. Um, so acquisition itself is a learning process in the sense that you, you discover. Whenever I've sat with a company and we go through strengths and weaknesses, I, you know, I find that incredibly boring. You know, uh, we're General Motors, we know how to build engines. No kidding, that's terrific. Um, I, I'd much rather go through a fa successes and failures discussion. What works and what doesn't, even with acquisition or anything else. Where are we really good? What works? Forget strengths and weaknesses. What works? You discover strengths and weaknesses by studying what works and what doesn't work. I saw a very good example of that the other day, actually. So a big company that is a pretty good company, a leader in its industry, was acquiring another company. And uh, their attitude was, um, on average, we're probably better than the company we're buying. Um, but if we de-average enough, if we look at 50 parameters, there are probably five where they're better than we are. We're going to find what they are, and we're going to learn from them, uh, which I thought was a very healthy, humble attitude. That's <laughs> good, British. Yeah, very British. <laughs> All right, your turn. Help me come up with some good questions for this terrific panel. There's one over here. Hi, uh, my name is Ricardo. Um, so following the, um, the theme of the panel around how to deal with strategy in times of crisis, my question to you is, uh, when do you cut your losses in a strategic initiative, right? So um, Watson, IBM and Watson had some layoffs recently. Um, I can think of a few other examples, the car uh, division within Apple. Uh, those are not as celebrated, but they happen. And my question to you is essentially, if you think differently about when to cut your losses in some of those initiatives for new territory in times of crisis. Thank you. I'm very inspired by something that a guy called Roy Rosen said. He used to be the chief innovation officer of Intuit. Um, he, he, he said with evidence that in the software industry, the, the things that turn out to be the best products are not the things that people thought would be the best products. They're the ideas that have the most chances to evolve. So I wonder whether cutting your losses is not, should not be regarded as a temporal thing. You know, are we making losses right now? Do we need, do we need to, cut, uh, to cut off the, uh, the stream? But rather, has, has the project had enough chances to, to evolve? So it's about speed of iteration. So, you know, one interesting way of, of looking at things that very few companies uh, avail themselves of, themselves of is their relative learning rate. You know, if you look at the uh, speed of new product generations, the speed of new product development versus competitors, at what rate are we learning? At what rate are we experimenting? If you look at companies in that way, on conventional you know, uh, metrics, companies could be 10% different and so on. But in terms of like comparative learning rates, they can be 100% different, huge differences between companies. Yeah, I think the worst time to cut your loss is when the stock market is getting impatient. Uh, b because you have to make your own decisions, not let the stock market make decisions for you. I, I love the case that James Bryan Quinn wrote years ago about Pilkington Glass, where, where this engineer had an idea, his name happened to be Pilkington, but he wasn't family. He, he, he came up with this idea of a new way of making plate glass. And um, they kept at it for seven years. They wasted 100,000 tons of glass developing it. Um, but he said something very interesting. He said, we kept going because we never met a problem we couldn't solve. Every time we solved the problem, we hit another one. And they kept at it seven years and uh, changed the whole industry. Yeah. If I can add one point, I think <clears throat> I would almost <coughs> phrase, frame the question a bit differently. Um, of course, you want to cut your losses. But even before that, how do we invest and measure our projects. I think there's a big problem there that we make big bets and then obviously big bets are more risky because we're not spreading our bets and then you know you cut the one thing you have. Great. <laughs> what you really want to do is figure out how to measure innovation or future growth engines differently and only invest in scaling when you're ready. Mm -hmm. So that's what some of the companies that are really good at innovation actually do. Mm -hmm. They don't scale prematurely. And, you know, take Alexa, for example, that took a long time. That was in the labs. They didn't cut it. They really had, you know, a lot of experimentation going on, but they were 
smart enough not to scale prematurely. So what you were saying about the learning aspect, you need to give time to learn, is extremely important because we can see that a lot of technologies will succeed based on timing and right business model. So we probably don't want to cut that, but we want to find a way to integrate that into our way of working. So I think the reason we now need to deal with cutting projects in times of crisis is that we prematurely scale. That's a problem we should avoid. So I can't answer, you know, when should we cut them because the whole system is set up wrong. Lots more questions. Why don't we take this one right here? Thank you. I want to ask a question about how to integrate failure as a success. So that's the lead in. But I would share just a story. I'm from Seattle, so on occasion you sit on a plane and you, you meet some of these innovators and they share stories. And there was a person that worked for Amazon who gets to work in, the, in that crazy place, he said, where we try out ideas. And he was, we were talking about different things that are in the news. One of them was the just go concept where you're able to walk into a store and just pick out what you want and just go. And everything is handled through our intelligence. And he said, we made such a big mistake with that. And I said, what was the mistake? He said, well, you know, we got everything right, the technology, the display, the sense of what it's like to go into it. it, it, it and people loved it, but we made a huge mistake. And I said, well, what was it? And he says, we forgot about stocking the shelves if you're successful. So inside of this idea was a failure factor. But we talk about Amazon as being able to accept failure, and it's a good idea. How do you program it into some more, uh, to, to more, um, Less in, to less innovative companies that haven't experienced that yet, because we're all familiar with the model where if you fail, you, you're, you know, you're, you're sort of walked out yeah. of the, yeah. the machine. I have a very strong opinion, so if I can start briefly, I think when the CEO or the chief explorer starts embracing failure and says, you know, failure is an integral part and we're the best place in the world to fail and says that to shareholders, which was the case of Jeff Bezos to his shareholders in 2005 or six or something, and acts like that with the right metrics, that's when you're getting somewhere. So number one, the leadership needs to embrace it. And number two, we need to put it into our metrics. Meaning we're going to have 10, 100, 200 projects and we're not going to depend on one. So we can experiment. So it's really all, it comes back to the metrics. Today, I think most organizations have one set of metrics and it should fit all. Well, guess what? Then everybody's going to avoid risk. So it really is, you know, it's, it's again organizational design. Design the metrics for learning to happen, and it will. It's not magic. It's really not magic. Henry, do you want to add anything just because failure is so uh, tied up in learning? Well, I, 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 I'm inclined to repeat with another word. I think it's all about the culture, basically, and saying the same thing. That a, that a culture is either uh, sympathetic to failure or it's not sympathetic to failure, and then it's back to community ship, basically. But if I, I've been in so many organizations where everything comes down from the top, and, and, and there's such an awful culture um, that everybody kind of grinds in their own mill and nobody gives a damn about anything, and those places are sick. I, they, they spend a lot of money on geriatric consulting. Um, but, but I always feel that these companies should die of heart attacks and not <laughs> answers that go on for years and years and years. OK, so maybe brings time. A, a good point. Just one, you know, the heart attack. So my friend Steve Blank, who taught, you know, launched the Lean yeah. Startup Movement, he says, well, maybe companies should die. Right? Maybe it's time for a lot of these organizations with the wrong organizational structures to die yeah, exactly. and be replaced, maybe, right? Yeah. Recycle the resources, yeah. including the human resources, yeah. <laughs> so it they is, can become a, yeah, human it's, beings. It's painful for the human factor, right? I mean, in that sense, it's easy to say it here, but there needs to be some rejuvenation. Right? Yeah, or creative destruction, as we have yeah. long called it. Yes, exactly. Um, maybe, do we have time for one more question? Over there. Yes, yes, over here, yes. And we'll make this super quick so that we can keep this event running like a Brazilian clock. <laughs> like a Brazilian organization. <laughs> I'll try to be fast. Um, so I feel it's, it's a contradiction um, when we talk about uh, community ship and uh, rewarding failure, all this talk about failure, but then on the same token, you know, we're using the, the, 
the Steve Jobs example of innovators, um, there's a lot of, there's a model out there, a mental model in organizations that look to the CEO, whether they're chief explorer or whatever, the highest paid person uh, at a company. And the idea, you know, of course, you know, in, in the materials, people do work in their own self-interest and oftentimes in a lot of organization, that self-interest is impressing the boss. Um, and the, if the boss has this vision, it just, there seems to be a big contradiction there um, in terms of community ship and the ability to get those ideas up when you're led by a visionary. I, I have an idea. Why don't you just replace CEOs with mirrors? So when they look to the CEO, they see themselves. Mm. And they say, go get that done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> any, le any final um, comments? I mean, so briefly, I think we, we often personify things that we haven't systematized. So I think some of the things that Alex said about metrics, I think it's possible to be systematic about some of the magical properties we celebrate in, in famous innovators. Uh, it's possible to measure you know, the, the, the number of experiments we're doing, the yield on those experiments, the progression speed of those experiments, the cost per failure. Some companies measure those things, many, many don't. And they don't have to appeal to magic properties and, and personalities. I think you know, that what you're bringing up is very important because what we see Steve Jobs on, you know, cover, used to see him on covers, and we see these successful entrepreneurs on covers, what we forget is that often they were actually not the decisive factor alone, right? I mean, Steve Jobs did not invent the iPhone. Do people know? No, they don't, because he was on the cover of every magazine and, you know, that you can find in the world. Same for entrepreneurs. One entrepreneur succeeds, there are 500 that don't, and then in that company, there were you know, a lot of people that contributed. So we glorify people, and I think that's not helpful in a, you know, an age where learning is so, so crucial. So I think there's education to be done there. Let's not put people on covers of magazines anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all we have time for. Um, we'll have time to hear more from Martin in a few minutes, but um, join me now in thanking him for his uh, his uh, contribution to this panel, and of course also Henry's and Alex's. Thank you.